Hi guys and welcome back to my oil painting channel. Today I'm going to be talking about how you get started in oils. So let's roll that intro. Let's see what happens. Hi everybody, welcome back. Now recently, a couple of my patrons have asked me, Paul, what do we need to do to get started in oil? What stuff do we need to buy? How do we go about it? So I felt that it'd be really nice to sit down, make a little video that would not just help them, but also help everybody else out there who is thinking right now of getting into oil for the very first time. And even if they've been in oil a little while, it's still worth having a look at for a few bits of information that might well be useful to you. Okay, everybody, before we go any further, let's talk about this stuff. This is what it's all about. This is oil color. And what is oil color? Well, it is merely a pigment and it is a binder. No different to watercolors, pastels or acrylics. There is a pigment and it goes by a scientific number. Normally a code PB maybe or something else. Whatever it is, it is the same number around the world doesn't matter what a color man who produces a paint calls it it has a number and that's really what you should be guided by the thing also is that it can come in be bound with many other types of products now the thing is that the more expensive paints are really refined and they have a lot of high pigment concentration and to a very well refined medium such as linseed but it could also be a walnut oil. It could be many other oils that are put to oil paint to create the paint that you use out of the tube. The most common, of course, is linseed oil. Now, the cheaper you go with paint, and I'm not knocking cheap paints at all, please don't get me wrong on this, but the cheaper you go, the more bulking, the more impurities become, and above all, the less pigment strength is added. And certainly the pure colors, such as the cadmiums and the cobalts, are not present in cheaper student ranges. They are too expensive pigments to add and create those in a tube and sell them as a student quality paint. Now, having said that, people say to me, well, I'm only learning. What do I, why do I need to spend out on this when I can buy a whole raft of colors for a fraction of the price? That's true. I do get that. But the point is that if you are painting with very cheap paints, then, of course, they're not going to act in the same way as good quality paints. And good quality paints will go further in the long run than cheaper paints. You need a lot more of that cheaper paint to create some of the colors that you can get here, especially with the whites. And I say to a lot of my students who can't really go out and afford some of this is to at least get a very decent white that will help you when it comes to mixing down some of your cheaper colors why cheaper over expensive well i've partly said that but i classify paint in three ranges there are what i call the really cheap stuff you know the stuff that comes from china the stuff that uh, is um, you know 10 tubes for two or three pounds it's almost rubbish it probably isn't quite but it's not far short then you get in the middle a fair chunk of uh, color that is called student quality i.e not artist quality and they are as they say they are for students to learn with sure you may consider yourself a student to learn with but even to the students i would actually add the fact that if you bought less colors but more expensive ones you would actually do better in the long run so that's only my personal take on it it's not set in stone and you can spend your own money and you can buy it into whatever color you wish to from whatever manufacturer and there are some stonking ones around the world that are creating fantastic colors i happen to use michael harding to the most part there is actually uh, this one here which is a Windsor and Newton and I do use a couple of other Windsor and Newton colors in my palette from time to time this is the only one at the moment so that 
pretty much tells you about color, but you are much better off buying fewer colors, but getting better quality, if you can possibly manage to do that. The ones that really will bite you hard are things like cobalt and the cadmiums. Now they are some of the higher end pigments to produce. And as I said earlier, you will not get those in a student quality um, color range. Uh, they are hues, they are mimics, they are chemical um, made up with cheaper pigment colors to resemble the cadmiums and the cobalt, but they actually do not white out as pure as these will white out. So you do get what you work for, uh, you do get what you pay for. And if if the budget is really pushed to get started, then maybe consider, as I said, a few student qualities or lesser range paints, but always buy a top quality white to mix with them. I always find that student quality whites are so uh, impure. A little quick touch on other paints while I'm on this subject. There is a, a Griffin range or an Alkid range from other companies. They are oils that may have a lot less pigment in them, but they have a quick drying agent in them. Now you can use things like Liquin here in a jar. This is not a proper jar of Liquin, but it is just decanted into a smaller jar so it doesn't go off. Um, but liquid is the same sort of component that you'll find in an Alkid uh, paint, whereby it has a property about it that causes the paint to set up and dry a lot faster than if it were not present. But you do pay um, probably a little less for an Alkid medium, but I don't find or have never found the pigments to be that good. They're not as strong as getting a decent paint. So that's just a something on there. And the other one that I know very little about is water soluble oils. And there's nothing wrong with them, I'm sure. I've never really used them. I did test them for a company once, wasn't really happy, but that's another story. There's got nothing to do with the product itself. Uh, I just find that when you, uh, the old adage, oil and water don't mix. Now I, I, pr I stand to be proven wrong. But I do believe that oil paint is oil paint, watercolor is watercolor, and the two really doesn't, they do not want to really mix. But anyway, that I leave up to you. But I can't tell you much about water soluble oils. Okay, now I've been rambling on about the paint. Let's talk about the surfaces that you can work on. Now, in theory, you can use any surface to oil paint on. And the idea is that you need a surface that is not so absorbent you need a surface that will take the paint now you could use cartridge paper and you could actually sort of rub that over with candle wax and i've done it whereby you just literally seal that cartridge paper off and then you can paint on that it's not as good but it does work and you could also use uh, a gesso you can take a sketchbook a standard cartridge sketchbook or indeed a watercolor piece of paper or anything you like. And you can actually then put some clear gesso over the top. I will try and leave some links in the description underneath this video for you to look at, and then you can go off and check out what's available. But gesso isn't cheap, but it is a, a, a like an acrylic primer to any surface. Now this indeed, this piece of board, this is just, 2.5 millimeter picture framers MDF. Now you can buy something very similar. You can buy it in America, you can buy something called Masonite, which is double sided tempered uh, hardboard. We don't have Masonite in this country, but what we do have is MDF, which is maximum or medium density fiberboard. Not quite sure which way that goes, but basically it is a glued composite board. Now, the thing is that if you cut this stuff, be aware, wear a face mask, do it outside. If you're going to sand the edges, even more care because the glues are quite carcinogenic and you don't want to be breathing any of the fine particles of this in as you're setting it up. But once you've got your board cut and many picture frame companies run a service where you can buy this board pre-cut in packs of so many 
and uh, then you don't even have to worry about it and they all come out the same size but what i do is i give my board three coats of a gesso now it is one in whatever direction you can be very very uh fine with it let me just show you this is another one and you can see the difference between the rough brush marks on here and what is a very very fine smooth surface this has had several coats on but they've been laid on with a very fine uh, foam roller the sort of one that you would use behind a um, uh, a radiator to to paint that same sort of thing but just finally on and you keep working it until it's almost dry and it becomes quite stipply then you give it a very light fine grade sanding off and you repeat the, you repeat the process this one has had the same idea but not with a roller with a standard brush and it makes it very very mark um orientated you can see the brush marks left in here there's a bit of a lump or something on there but you can see the brush marks and you can leave those in at the end you still give it a very fine keying with some very fine 240 grit sandpaper of some description but it will set the surface up to receive oil paint very very smooth quite rough and you can go a lot rougher than that you can put other bulking mediums into this uh, that you can get with acrylic paints and really give this some uh, heavy marks in here if that's what you wish to do now having said that you can save money and you can go and buy something like this there are many manufacturers out there this is oil paper this is Clairefontaine and you can buy a very similar thing a little less expensive from someone like Dale Rowney, Windsor and Newton this is just happens to be Clairefontaine and I'm sure there are dozens more out there that uh, I haven't even thought about that create fine art paper. Now this is uh, mimicked, it's mold made and it's mimicked to look like a canvas. I don't know if I can get that to show you. So you can see a texture and a weave on there and that will be ready to take oils. It's sealed so that you can it will receive or uh, an oil paint and it will not seep through the problem is if you put oil paint onto standard cartridge paper the oil will leach through the back and it will dry and crack off on the surface and leave an awful stain which will spread through all the paper fibers this however has been treated with a gesso and it will not do that so it comes this one happens to come as a block and you can paint on your surface you can take it off once it's dry or indeed you can remove it before it's dry not like a watercolor block where you have to wait for that to tension out this will not buckle with oil paint on but it will stay that way it's a nice way to paint and it's a nice way to create artwork without having to go to expensive boards well these well, i'm saying that expensive these are not these are sort of less than five or six pounds for 25 30 boards and you just got to prep them uh, however you want these are probably i don't know nine ten pounds for a pad this is just a small pad this is a uh, 110 pound nine and a half by 12 inch pad you can buy these in almost any size that you want to so those are two surfaces now of course what i haven't actually talked about yet is canvas but canvas is something for later on. That's why I'm really not talking about it. The thing about canvas is that it's yay thick. It's, you know, it's certainly going to be three quarters to an inch deep. And uh, even worse if you use some of these box canvases that you can get. The thing about that is that um, it takes up room. It's first and foremost when you're learning, it's not cheap to buy canvases. These things, this pad, this piece of board and other boards like it take up much less room there's 15 sheets there and they will not take up uh, the depth of half of or a third of one canvas and there are 15 paintings that can be stored here these boards they take up they're two and a half mil thick and you know you can put a bundle of these together uh, and before they occupied the space that one canvas will take up and they don't have the value they don't have the cost in them and they will work with oil paints very very well in fact you'll find that many plein air painters seldom work on canvases 
they work on boards uh, or paper, but mainly on boards. And it's very easy to transport, very easy to protect. And uh, as I say, if you're doing a lot of work, then they are very easy to store up on a shelf without taking too much room up. So that's why I'm really not discussing canvases in this video, because that is a subject for another video and a more in-depth one. So we talked about that paper and we talked about the color. Let's talk about brushes. Now brushes are very, very personal. I've got heaps of them. This is one of probably about eight or nine different sets of brushes that I carry. Now, I personally, and this is personal, like synthetics. I like to have that nylon hair. It gives a softer mark to when I create an old painting. But the traditional one is, of course, hog. Hog bristles. Let's get rid of that for a minute. Hog brushes. Now, hog is, as it says, it's pig's hair. And it's a lot coarser. It can also be a lot more brittle. It can break off with constant work and you find little bits breaking off on your brush. And the thing about oil painting is that it is extremely destructive to any brush. If you've got a canvas surface, a coarse surface, unlike the, the subtleties of watercolor paper, oil paper or oil canvases are very, very hard on any brush and they will destroy a brush. You can see the shape of this beautiful uh, dagger. When it looks like that, you would think, oh, that looks lovely. But when you see it like that, you can see some of the punishment that this one has suffered during the course of painting. So bear in mind that there are a couple of ways you can go. Not everybody likes these, not everybody likes these. And it depends on where you wanna go as to what you invest your money in. What I would say is that like anything else, a quality brush is always your best option. It will last you longer and it will do you better long term. Cheap brushes drop too many hairs, cause you too many problems and splay out even faster than some of these more expensive ones. But even if a brush has got worn like this one or any of the others that I have here, um, they have still got a purpose long term. Uh, so don't just oust them out and dump them. Uh, they can be found uh, useful when it comes down to some other way of painting. So, yeah, uh, as to the type of brush, well, I use Rosemary & Company. You all know that. And if any of you are sort of driven to go and buy some from her, whatever whether it's a watercolor, oil or acrylic or anything else, then always think about me if you wouldn't mind just putting a uh, my name, Paul Apps, uh, in capitals, unbroken, uh, into the affiliate link tab when you go to order. That will help me out tremendously and I'd appreciate that a lot. That's the sales pitch over, but let's get back to these. Now, what ones do you want? Well, to start off with, then I would go for maybe a couple of each types. I would go for two sizes of dagger. They're such a useful brush. You can see how badly I've looked after this one. There's old paint that has not been cleaned off properly by me, but we'll go into that. And um, so I would go for two sizes of these, maybe the large and maybe the half size, so that you get two different uh, widths. And then there is a thing called a filbert. Now you can get short or long ones. I prefer the spring in a long filbert, but a couple of different sizes maybe, if you can afford to. And flats, uh, I go for long flats. Again, I like the spring. And I go for a short and a, and a large one. You know, if you can afford more, then buy more. It's as simple as that. They will not last as long as any watercolor brush. They can't. They are abused too much by the materials. But look how that is almost around really. It's, it's got purpose, but not much more as a lovely edge flat brush. And a, the other thing that I would say is essential is two or three riggers. I use them a lot. They will give up their shape quite fast, um, but they will give you good uh, working. This one you can see has splayed. This one is still nice and tight, but again, they have different uses. So there you are. Now the types of brush that I use in nylon form, 
are two types. This one is called the Shiraz. This is a brown filament brush. I love them. There are also the other ones that I use more of are called the Evergreen. And that is just two of Rosemary's uh, types of brush. This one looks very much like a hog. It's not, it's a white nylon called an ivory. And they are sort of a little stiffer. These are a little springier. And well, that one's very worn, but you get the idea. So it really doesn't matter which of these three, Shiraz, Evergreen or Ivory that you go for. But then you can always buy the hogs if that's the more traditional route that you wish to go. The reason for hogs in a sense is they hold more paint and they can display more paint and leave you a much coarser brush mark showing in your painting. I like to paint quite finely and I've never been one for doing massive marks in the paint, leaving brush marks. Great if you're doing a lot of um, heavy work and impasto work, but I don't tend to do that. I tend to paint quite thinly. So there you go. That's a little bit about brushes. It's just a quick touch, but you get the idea. When it comes to cleaning brushes, and you've seen how badly I've done that process sometimes, but when you do that, then one thing that you can do, one thing you will need is a medium. Now this is a solvent based medium and I'm afraid this is where solvents are getting a bad name overall. Some of the earlier ones, I mean, for many years I worked in um, sort of some of the very cheap um, spirits that you can buy from do it alls and and uh, decorator shops and they are really awful and they smell really bad but over time there have been companies that have come out with different other products now one of them is a thing called um, uh, zest it which is z e s t hyphen i t another one is gamsol from america and there are no end of others they are odorless thinners they are not smelly as the name would suggest but they are very very good at cleaning your brushes now i have seen people use this in and use them as mediums indeed i've done so myself i choose not to do that uh, with this i merely buy the brush cleaner that's all i use it for i don't use it as a medium although i do know that this product has been sold as a medium because it's joined with other oils and other things that all said and done, uh, there are other things that you can buy as mediums and i touch on those right at the end. What do I put mine in? Well, I bought one of these um, sort of metal. You can see how goopy that is, awful. But every so often I treat it to a clean up, pour this off, clean it out and start afresh. But never ever tip this down the drain. Apart from the environmental issues, you can actually decant this off into a jam jar and you can pour off the good quality stuff once all the sediment is settled and you can actually do that over several chambers of, of bottles and jars to reuse this stuff and you know you can make it go an awful long time just by reusing it may look may not look as pure as the day you poured it in there but it's still very very functional and will save you money long run and just get rid of all the stuff don't be tempted to use the stuff that's sludgy in the bottom. It doesn't dry, it doesn't work, it hasn't got the backup to congeal and to set up as a paint. It will not hold, so forget that, just dump it. Um, but you can, as I say, siphon off the good stuff once it's settled and carry on using it. And all I do with this, it's uh, this, I mean, there are very, the, this pot, there are many on the market. It is just a 10 pounds pot off of Amazon, or Jackson's or one of these other companies, there are some very expensive ones. You know, I've seen Holbein ones that are looking very, very good, but they're a huge amount of money. And I don't believe that they're worth that. Okay, so let's quickly talk about some of the things that you can use to make your paint move out of the tube. Now, the thing is that the one of the best ones, one of the easiest to obtain is a thing called Liquin, Liquin Original. This is Liquin Original. It's decanted out of a larger bottle into a small uh, preserve pot, but that will go hard and horrible after a while. And as you can see, constantly dipping in will pick up color from your brushes too. 
and it will influence other mixes. But look at it, and it doesn't move. It's sort of sitting there. It's not completely thixotropic. There is a version called impasto liquid, which comes in a tube, and that can squeeze out onto your painting surface, onto your palette, as it were, and will not move. And a lot of plein air painters use the impasto does a very very similar thing but they don't have to have extra pots kicking around knocking off onto the floor or onto the sand or wherever it is and getting wrecked they can put a little bit out on their palette and work with that but then there is also the same product but is a very fine liquid this is fine detail same sort of thing as you can see very fluid it's just like um, a syrup maybe a little bit less than cream but certainly a lot more than milk it would be but this is doing the same detail stuff as this one will it's just if you want to use a rigger and to put the paint on in very very fine strokes this will allow that paint to free move but still have the drying in there are other alkyd mediums out there this is another company this is alkyd flow medium same sort of principle as you can see very fluidic and it's no different to the uh, Winsor & Newton product. Then you get things that we all hear about, refined linseed oils. And they can be mixed with distilled turpentine, which is a product, sap product from um, uh, <laughs> conifer trees, um, that sort of thing. And um, it's got a lovely, I love that pine, uh, pine trees, that sort of thing. I, I love the smell of that stuff. I can sit and smell that all day long. Um, I don't know if that's good for me, but I can do that. But the traditional mixes are using a good English distilled turpentine with a very good refined linseed oil. There are a number out there on the market to choose from. There is no one product that I would suggest above another. And um, it's what your purse will go to. This is a large bottle. You can buy a smaller bottle. You don't need that much of it. So you can mix this into whatever ratio you want. And you can use it as a medium to push your paint around the canvas. I would suggest something like 50-50 uh, or 40-60. Or, uh, something like that. Depending on how free you want that to mix down. But bear in mind that when you are looking at painting in uh, oils, this is what I call dry brush. When I tell my students to paint dry brush, I'm telling them it's not dry. But what I'm telling them is to try and use the paint almost directly out of the tube, if they can. Sometimes it's stiff. Sometimes the environment is cold. And sometimes you have to add a medium to that to make it move. Now, I would say use a dry brush, but I would also say use this because what happens is this will allow that paint to move, but at the same time, it will allow uh, the thing to dry up faster. So that's a very quick touch on a, a mediums. We've done the surfaces, we've done the brushes, we've done the paint. What else is there? Well, let's just talk about, we've done all the products to get set up with. Let's just talk about how you actually start putting it on. Okay, so let's just have a little play around with some color and let's just talk about some of the fundamentals of applying paint. Now, you can put your color on in many ways and you can have it straight out of the tube, which I call a dry brush method. The paint will still move, but it is um, a little drier than if I was to use a lot of fluid to it you can see here how that fluid is struggling to uh, cover anything it's more of a stain than anything else and you can use any of this in between and you can apply any other color this is again this is a little bit of uh, oil in my brush so there's actually more fluid in there than I would uh, sort of recommend using but let's just put that blue in and the thing is that it will want to mix that's the thing with oil paint it just wants to mix with whatever you put it onto or next to so let's just add in some red into there staying quite good but the more i go over the more that red is corrupted and because it just wants to mix with all that fluid that's already there when you clean your brush out very very quickly when you do that 
then especially if it's an oil, it's like a citrus oil or a solvent citrus, such as uh, zest it, the oil will travel down here. You've cleaned your brush out, but you've, the oil's traveled down here and will sit in the root of the brush. Try, if you can, to make sure that you clean the brush extremely thoroughly. If you don't, what will happen is you'll mix your next color up and then that oil wants to start running down and join with your paint. And where you think you've got the consistency about right, all of a sudden you'll find that it becomes an oil slick. So just be aware of that, but make sure that you clean your brush thoroughly. Don't scrub it, you'll destroy it. Try and do it as best you can in line with the way the brush is set. Okay, so one of the hardest things that people ask me about is they want to keep working, but it takes so long to dry between belts. One thing you can do is start to learn in little bits of paper how to work wet in wet. And the way that you can work wet in wet is deciding how wet the paint is going to be when you apply it. You really just want to put on enough to make the statement that you intend to make. And any more fluid, then you're going to have problems. You're going to have problems working that paint into the next one or laying over the top. We've all done it, we've all been there, but if you work too much, and what I see people do is they put like a color on here and they keep working it, working it, working it, and all you've done is created whatever that and that join together make that. Now, the nice thing about working wet in wet is to try if you can and apply your color in a one mark. The more you put it on, the more that mark will disappear and become dull and degraded. A nice clean mark will keep it nice and fresh. And that's what you're aiming to do. So you can work wet in wet as long as you are being very careful that you don't overwork that passage of paint you've just applied. Equally, you can put this on, you can let it dry, and you can come back over that without the fear of losing it into the background. So that is the other way. I'm just merely talking about wet and wet at this time. Now, with watercolor, traditionally, you work light to dark, and therefore your white paper is your brightest mark, and your darks are your darkest mark at the end. They are the final things that you put in. With an oil painting, or indeed an acrylic painting, and to a degree, uh, a pastel painting, is that you work from dark through to light. And the last bits that you put on are the most important highlights that you have in your painting. I'm just going to mix down some color. And I'm just going to suggest this. Now, there are so many other things to think about when it comes to oil painting. I've barely scratched the surface, and yet I think I've been rabbiting on quite a while now. And I may have to bring this to a very quick close very soon. But here, we can now, we've got our dark on. So I tell my students when they set up their painting, look for all their dark parts. Look for the darkest darks that they can find and put those in. So this may be my darkest point. Now, if I've got a tinted or colored paper, and I talked about that in another video, but if I had that, then I could put my whites on. Indeed, if I put my whites on here, you really won't see it. And so you do need the benefit of a toned canvas to do that. But in a sense, you've got to look at your lightest lights as well. But if you can then come in and you can start to build some of your light colors and you can start to build differences from the dark, you're adding lights, either white or other lighter values of yellow maybe or brighter red whatever it might be but you can change what you're seeing and you can bring that up and you can add more to it and therefore you can put a lighter mark in a brighter mark until you come right up to the final part where you just put in a little bit of highlight through your painting and create those lovely little lights that ordinarily you would be white paper if it were a watercolor a good tip when it comes to painting in oils is whatever color you're using, say this brown, if I want that brown, that's great, and I can put that down. But if 
I want another colour, say I want a darker colour. I can put, pick up some blue, but don't put that blue in here. To get the colour you want, you'll end up putting a lot of expensive paint into that to change it. Merely change a little bit on one side. And then you can come in and you've altered that colour. And if you want even more, you want it orange, come in with the orange. But do not necessarily take off all of that colour. Keep some. I'm working in small puddles, but when you work this way, what's happening is if I'm doing my painting and I suddenly think that I really wanted a bit of that blue that I had earlier, it's still there. And I can come back in and pick some up and carry on working. If I've gone like that, I put a lot of paint together. I haven't got the colour I want. I wanted that brighter orange and I haven't got it. What I've got is that dull orange. So what I've got to do is I've got to use more expensive paint now into that big pile just to get that orange. And I'm still not there. And I'm going to come back with even more to create the brighter orange that I'm looking for. So when you are uh, mixing colours and you're working in a certain passage, warm or cool, is to start little puddles and let them grow. They organically grow across your palette but they are changing as you're adding pigments in. Nowhere did you see me put that white into the whole of whatever. I've still got a blue, a yellow, a brown or dark colour, and I've got the paler colours. And I can drop back into those. So that is, and I've probably gone way too long with this already, but that is a very, very quick look into oil painting. Um, and uh, I probably, depending on how well this goes down, whether I actually do a much longer one for you or one that details specific actuals within the course of painting, whether it's brushes, the paint or the surfaces. And we'll see how we go from there. All right. I hope you've enjoyed that. I do hope that you've got something from it. And, um, and I look forward to seeing you all in a video in the future. Hi guys and welcome back to the Oil Painting Channel. Now recently a couple of my... Start that again. Hi. Hi guys and welcome back. Now recently a couple of my patrons from my watercolour patron have asked me how do they get started in oils. Now... <laughs> Hi guys and welcome back. Now recently a couple of my patrons from the watercolour patron channel have asked me how did the... the mm, how Hi guys and welcome back. Now as I said at the start, the content and at the same time if you're not a subscriber, please please subscribe to the channel. It's very young and as a channel and it needs all the help it can get to grow. So give it the thumbs up, give it that uh, subscribe, comments, likes, all those things. <clears throat> start again then. <laughs>